collapsing area. I will begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day, and I thank you uh, for this class, this opportunity we have just to uh, meet together and study partial differential equations and a little bit about physics, and just pray that you just bless this time we have together, Lord. You know my pray. Amen. So you guys asked me, in Haberman, it would seem, and I hadn't even picked up on this, um, little an versus big an, and it's, it's pretty simple. So he um, has f of x, and it's basically uh, almost equal to a naught plus the sum um, n equals 1 to infinity uh, a sub n cosine n pi x over l uh, plus sum n equals 1 to infinity uh, b sub n, little b sub n. So you guys have pointed out that he's got some capitalization in other, sp in other spots. This is the so-called full Fourier series. So this guy has a sub naught equal to 1 over 2L integral from minus L to L f of x dx. It has a sub n equal to 1 over uh, L integral from minus L to L uh, f of x cosine n pi x over L and it has b sub n 1 over L integral from minus L to L f of x sine of n pi x over L. Alright. In contrast, <clears throat> he talks about the um, he also talks about the so-called uh, Fourier sine series or the Fourier cosine series. So this thing that I just wrote up here is something you would use perhaps to model something that was neither even nor odd, something that was some kind of mixture of even and odd over minus L to L. And it would, uh, it would repeat it, uh, you know, periodically. Now, <clears throat> so the other thing, um, I guess I'll write it here, was something like f of x is... Um, I'm going to say a naught. Well, no curses. What's that stupid thing? Oh, he just he folds the uh, he folds the zeroth case into the sum, of course, in this case. So sum n equals zero to infinity, capital a sub n cosine n pi x over l. And or f of x is sum n equals one to infinity of capital B sub n sine of n pi x over L. Um, so this is the the so-called the Fourier cosine series, and. Um, Basically, it's the Fourier series of the even extension of f of x from 0L to the full minus L to L. So this isn't actually based on f of x over the full minus L to L. It's based on f of x from 0 to L and the periodic, the, the even extension of that, like we talked about. And so the a sub n, um, basically just going up here, it's really just this, um, but the even extension, so it's, you know, um, 2 over L integral from 0 to L f of x cosine n pi x over L dx and this one the b sub n is 2 over L integral from 0 to L f of x sine of n pi x over L dx if I had half a brain, I would have written these on the sideboard I don't use too much, so I didn't have to keep rewriting them over and over and over again in our last three meetings. But I'm not that smart, so here we are. But these are different things, right? Like, <clears throat> I 
here, uh, just for, for once and for all, let's just sort of visualize without so much calculation what the difference is. So if I had some function, right, and the function, here's L, here's minus L, um, and the function is something like Not so complicated. Something like, um, let's see here, it'll be simple. How about x squared? x squared? Okay, I can do that. Right. So there's x squared, right? Now, um, what this one would do is so this is the you know y equals f of x that's given, right? For minus l to l. The full Fourier series, what it's going to do is it's going to converge to the purple, but then uh, when it gets over to here, it's going to do like this. And so forth and so on. So that's, that's going to be the full Fourier series, case number one. Um, two, so here's my f of x again, right? So two is the cosine series. Um, so this was not a very good example. Oh, it's it, just the same for you. Because series. it's the same for the, uh, oh, yeah. the cosine series. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Because x squared is its own even extension. So fine. Well, you save me some writing. This is one and two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, you know, if it had been something like okay, so. Um, Right, fine, yeah, yeah. And then, um, okay, so let's do three. Three would be the odd extension, so like, it basically would be matching the, the Fourier series, would then do this kind of deal, like that. And then, so what's actually gonna happen is, okay, so like on the, um, on these, It'll be like here, and then it's gonna. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the, uh, the, the, you know, periodic extension of the, the sine series. It's, you take the from 0 to L, you extend oddly to the full thing and then it repeats. So, I mean, the sine series is the full Fourier series of the odd extension of the function from 0 to L to minus L to L. But that's the difference between the little a's and the, and the, um, the big a's, big b's. All right, so, that clear that up? I mean, that's the distinction. So just a question to make sure. So in this case, when we do write the full Fourier series, the, uh, the b sub n co coefficient will all be zero for that case, right? The little b sub n? Since we could write it as Wait, just so the, When we write the what? Like the full Fourier series, like f of x. Uh-huh. We could do the full Fourier series with just the cosine parts. So we could have all the b sub n coefficients is, is equal to zero? Yeah, we okay. could have all the a sub n's zero too, we could just have just a naught in principle. Wait, what? I mean, there are some, you could just have the constant term, no cosines. Oh, no, I mean, just for the x squared case that we did there, since that was in, yeah. Mm. Sorry, I just... Oh yeah, for the cosine, yeah. very good, for the x squared, all the b's would be zero. Because, 
you'd have x squared times sine over an odd, oh, you know, and x squared times sine is an odd function over a symmetric interval about the origin. Those integrals vanish, all of them. Just so important to use the even odd integral tricks to do calculations here. All right, so I um, wanted to prove for you guys the term by term differentiation deal. Um, so, uh, what's his? Uh, he has he has a few few theorems he states here. Um, first of all, the one he states is that um, if am I too high? Um, can it be seen? No, you're good. Uh, if f prime of x is piecewise smooth. Um, then a continuous Fourier cosine series of x continuous Fourier so Fourier cosine series is, that's case 2 All right. Um, um, of f of x can be uh, differentiated term by term. Oh, stink. That's a subcase. Though actually the before even that he has a more general kind of statement. He says a Fourier series that is continuous can be differentiated term by term if f prime of x is piecewise smooth. I'll write that down to you. A Fourier series, which is case one, all right, that is continuous um, can be differentiated. term by term um, if f prime of x is piecewise smooth. So let me, let me try to unwrap that for a second here. Oh, he has a fourth thing, a th or third thing rather. Um, if f prime of x is piecewise smooth, then the Fourier cosine series of a continuous function f of x can be determined. Fine, let me, make, let me get this third one out here. If f prime of x is piecewise smooth, all right, then the Fourier cosine series cosine series of a continuous function f of x um, can be differentiated term by term. Okay, so these are actually three separate theorems, and then next he's got a, in the next page he's got two more such theorems for the sine series. Or maybe I should just write those, get it out of my system. Yeah, here's the sine theorem. <laughs> if f of x is piecewise smooth, all right, then a continuous Fourier sine series a continuous Fourier sine series um, of f of x can be differentiated term by term. Like his next 
version of this theorem just elaborates on that a little bit more specifically, which is that if f prime of x is piecewise smooth, um, then the Fourier sine series of a continuous function for a sine series of continuous function f of x can be differentiated term by term term by term if f of 0 is equal to 0 and f of l is equal to 0. So we're actually going to prove the last one of these. He says the proofs of the others are similar. I'm inclined to believe him. Um, let's just take a second here to try to think about what, what these theorems are really saying. So first of all, the first one, if f prime, so I mean, you got to think about all of these, like what's, what's happening is you're given a function, right? And then you're calculating Fourier series or cosine series or sine series for that function. So the continuity or the, or the piecewise differentiability of the function is a separate thing than the Fourier series. Let's start with, that's one thing we got to make clear in our mind, all right? So you're given the function f prime of x piecewise smooth then a continuous Fourier cosine um, series of f of x can be differentiated term by term. So, um, what would it take for the cosine series to be continuous? So you suppose the function you're given, so we need piecewise smooth, right? Uh, piecewise smooth could be something like this, right? Something like that would be, is f prime of x piecewise smooth? Yeah. On the pieces, it's differentiable. Um, does it have a continuous Fourier cosine? Um, no. It does not. So to get a continuous Fourier cosine, I think, I think it suffices to have a continuous function, right? Like. What's item number two? If a Fourier series that's continuous can be differentiated term by term. Um, oh, this was actually the first. This is the. This this actually is before in Heberman. This is the one that comes first. Sorry, that comes after this. Um, but like before that, he's saying. So like the the picture for this would be something like what would work for it is if you had something like. Um, I don't know. Well, see, it has to begin and end at the same point, right? I mean, like, I think it could work if you had something that was beginning and ending at the same point, right? I mean, it has to, whatever. It has to be such that the periodic extension of the window is continuous, is what he's saying. Provided the f prime of x is piecewise smooth, he says. 3, f prime of x is piecewise smooth, and the Fourier cosine series of a continuous function, f of x, can be differentiated term by term. Okay, yes. If f of x is continuous, that rules this out, right? It's more like, well, you know, um, yeah, okay, so that, this would fall, the picture like this would be kind of like this picture over here. Am I pointing outside the range? Yeah, I'm... Oh, yeah, good, thanks. Um, if f of x is piecewise smooth, then a continuous Fourier sine series. What is a piece? What is a continuous Fourier sine series? Well, I mean, so if the sine looks like, um, you know, this. If you're doing this right, then you do the odd extension of it. So it's 
like that, right? Uh, I can't do it. Uh, right? And then yeah. so forth. That's not continuous. That's not going to work. You need, you, you need what happens in the glass case, right? You need something that it's going like this, so that when you extend it, it's, you know, and then that repeats over and over and over again, and these are continuous. So the, in other words, the, the whatever the, whatever the function creates for the Fourier series has to be continuous if you're going to do the term by term differentiation. That's what it's saying. Um, all right, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, where'd you go? So we're going to work on the last one, all right? Our goal is going to be um, Oh, I hate to erase those, but I, uh, actually I'm going to erase these because we're just going to work on the last one. A little bit of zoom out. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay, so he says uh, we want to look at the term by term differentiation of the Fourier sine series of a continuous function f of x. Okay, so. This is going to be a discussion, which will become a proof, and then a statement of yet another theorem. Okay. But hopefully it's going to be essentially a proof of the last one that I sedated. You'll see. So he's like, this is from page 116 of Haberman, by the way. Um, so he's like, let you know, f of x be continuous. Uh, suppose f of x is continuous. All right. Um, we want to look at the Fourier sine series. So f of x is almost equal to, right, um, the sum um, n equals 1 to infinity uh, b sub n, capital B. Thanks for putting that out, Jess. Um, sine of n pi x over L. All right. Now, he says equality holds, this is 3.48 in his numbering. He says equality holds here only if f of 0 and f of l are both equal to 0. All right, now he hasn't, he hasn't shown that yet. He, that's what we're trying to show. Um, he says if f prime of x is piecewise smooth, then it has a Fourier cosine series, A naught. Now, when you're first reading this or hearing it discussed, it seems like he's just assuming the point. <laughs> Stick with me here for a little bit. We'll, we'll get to it. I don't. I don't think the argument's circular, but you have to. You have to give it a minute here. Um, this is the Fourier cosine series of the derivative. All right. So. This series, he says, will, will not converge to f prime of x at points of discontinuity of f prime of x. Right? So this will... doesn't converge to f prime of x where f prime of x is discontinuous. That's not really part of the proof. He's still teaching about what Fourier series how Fourier series behave in the middle of this proof, you know? Just driving me a little bit nuts. Anyway, we will have succeeded in showing a Fourier sine series may be differentiated term by term if what? What's the claim? What would term by term, what was the actual the claim of that? that fifth theorem I wrote a second ago, now that we have all this uh, uh, notation in front of us. Five o'clock p.m. 
the arm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shush. All right, so um, term by term differentiation, right, would have meant that um, we can differentiate this and get to that, right? So it would mean that f prime of x is equal to, you know, sum uh, n equals 1 to infinity. Differentiating this term by term would look like what? It would look like L v sub n over n pi, right? Wait a minute, why am I integrating? I'm sorry, what's wrong with me? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Differentiate. I do that so much. Differentiate. Differentiate. Increase. n pi v sub n over L, cosine of n pi x over L, right? Using the chain rule and term by term differentiation. Um, um, -dum 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 -dum. Hmm. That's what he says here. He says, um, we will have succeeded in showing the Fourier sine series may be different term by term differentiated if we can verify that f prime of x, sorry, is equal to that, which is to say what? That is a sub naught is equal to zero and a sub n is equal to n pi v sub n divided by L. Right. So let's recap. We're given a Fourier sine series. We're given um, that the derivative, we're assuming that the f prime of x is piecewise smooth. All right? In other words, piecewise continuous. Um, and now we're hoping to be able to prove, right, that um, a sub 0 is 0 and a sub n is n pi n, n pi b sub n over L. But the question then, guys, is how are the capital A sub 0 and capital A sub n defined? Right? Those are the Fourier coefficients of what? The A sub n's are just the cosine series. But, yes, but cosine series of what? The, uh, I guess the f, f prime. prime of f x. prime of x, right? Yeah. yeah. So, to define, I mean, basically those are defined in terms of integrals of the derivative. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So, in particular, we have a sub 0 is equal to, going back to here, um, 2 over L, right, integral from 0 to L of f prime of x dx. Does that make sense? But then fundamental theorem of calculus says that that's 2 over L, f of L, minus f of 0. All right. So that's point number one. Point number two, if you calculate <coughs> a sub um, So we want to do the same thing for the other one, right? A sub n, by definition, is what we just said, 2 over L, the integral from 0 to L, of df dx uh, times the cosine of n pi x over L.
So we do integration by parts. To move the derivative from f to the cosine. Right? Let me remind you guys how to look at integration. So if we have df dx times g, right? That's like, just using notation a little bit here, that's the integral of fg, excuse me, it's the integral of ddx of fg minus um, f times dg dx. I can only really remember it in terms of u's and v's. Yeah. <laughs> 2 over L. And so this term, right, is the integral of a total derivative. I want to pan over for a second. This term is the integral of a total derivative. So when we add bounds, this just becomes over here. We have f, you know, we have f, f of x cosine n pi x over L evaluated from 0 to L, right? And then what's next? Um, minus the integral of f of x times the derivative of the g, g being the cosine, so that's n pi over L sine of n pi x over L. Seem to have worked myself into a corner. It's here, literally. There's a plus because there's a minus from the derivative of the cosine, right? Let me work around the corner here. So how's that clean up? Oh, check that out. We got f of x integrated against sine. What's that? So first of all, we get 2 over L, right? This guy, when you plug in L, we've got f of... What happens if we plug in L here? Yeah. Cosine of n pi, right? Remember what cosine of n pi is? Negative 1 to the n. Negative 1 to the n. Plug in 0 you get minus f of 0, right? And then plus n pi over L, right? Integral. And tell you what, let me put a parenthesis here and bring that 2 over L over here because I want to use it in a second. Uh, n, pi, n pi over L integration from 0 to L, uh, but, 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 f of x, sine of n pi x over L. <sighs> What's this? That is the piece of n, the big piece. So what do we have? We have derived that a sub n is equal to 2 over L times minus 1 to the n f of L minus f of 0 plus n pi b sub n over L. So what do we want? We wanted to get this claim of term-by-term -term differentiation, right? We agreed a little bit ago that, that that amounted to having a sub not equal to zero, right? This guy has to be zero, right? And this guy has to be what? Just this thing over here, right? Mm -hmm. Just the uh, n pi b sub n over L. How can you make that happen? F L equals f zero. Otherwise. Right, f f L equals f zero. That makes a zero equal to zero, but that's not enough. 
See, because if they're equal, that doesn't guarantee this is zero over here necessarily. Unless they're both, both zero. Both oh, yeah. Zero. Because of the negative one end term. Right. Okay. I like that. And so that's where our term by term differentiation theorem for sign comes from. We need that f of 0 is equal to f of l is equal to 0 if we're just going to do naive term by term differentiation. Otherwise, we still have a theorem. Right. This proof not only shows you that the assuming both of them are zero works, it shows you what term by term dis differentiation is replaced with in the event that in the event that you're not looking at such a case, right? So like hmm. let's just put it I mean basically what we have, we've got um, you know, given if um, f of x has a piecewise smooth derivative and it has a Fourier sine series given like this. Um, right? Then you have f prime of x is equal to, or let, me, let me just check on the equals. Like, uh, well, not equals. It's, it's mostly equals to, except for you know, jumps. Um, a sub naught is generally. Um, You gotta help, you gotta watch me here. This has a different thing. This is a sub zero is one over l. One over l. Okay. That was the definition of a sub l. Let me check on that for sure. Where did he do that to start with? That's on page 103, 3.3.19. Uh, There's no 2 in the A sub dot formula. Okay. So that means that there's no 2 here, or here. Okay, thanks. So here it is. Uh, collecting my collecting our calculations, we've shown that f prime of x should be basically by integration by parts uh, one over l uh, f of l minus f of zero, and then the a sub n, right? This thing plus the sum uh, n equals one to infinity of the a sub n, which the a sub n was actually 2 over l minus 1 to the n, f of l minus f of 0, close parentheses, me makes a big parenthesis here, plus n pi b sub n over l, where b sub n are the given ones from the sine series, all of that cosine n pi x over l. So it's not term by term differentiation, but this is the modification of term by term differentiation which is necessary when you don't have f of 0 uh, equals to f of l equals to 0. You do this. found, remember we found the Fourier sine series for x, like a class or two ago, what was it? We had f of x equals to x, right? 
What was the Fourier sine series we found for that? Do you guys can you guys tell me? I got it somewhere. I'll find it eventually. But. Minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n pi sine of n pi x over L. Alright. Is there s n equals 1 to infinity? This is the Fourier sine series for x. Is there supposed to be an L in there? I got an L there. I don't know. No, I mean like L on the outside, like 2L negative 1 minus plus 1. I've got a Oh, oh, there's an L. Yeah, I got an L. I'm sorry. You're right. I saw it, but I, I said it, but I didn't write it. Okay. Yes. So, of, co of course, this one, we have f of 0 equals to 0, but f of L is equal to L. <laughs> In fact, right? Is f prime of x piecewise smooth? Well, f prime of x here is one. But that's piecewise smooth. <laughs> Pretty sure one is the constant function. One is piecewise smooth. That's okay. So, as you guys recall, this was the example that blew up in our face in the undocumented lecture, and uh, <laughs> then we came to understand that this was the quintessential example of uh, a series that you can't differentiate term by term because what you have to do is this for that one, if you're going to differentiate it, all right? So let's do that now and see what happens. So we get f prime of x, right? Which, by the way, we can calculate directly, right? Like, this is the most complicated way to differentiate x with respect to x possible, right? Like, I'm not going to differentiate directly. Instead, I'm going to find the Fourier sine series and differentiate term by term. And in so doing, find the derivative of x. Not the most efficient way to differentiate x, but perhaps a good way to illustrate the theorem. That remains to be seen. So this is what? You get 1 over L, L, plus sum n equals 1 to infinity. And we got ourselves what? 2 over L, the, the f of 0 is 0, right? So we get 2 over L minus 1 to the n, f of l was what? l, right? Then plus what? b sub n was what? This stuff. So n pi over l, again the b sub n was 2 l minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n pi, I'm just writing cosine over there. What is all this? The n pi's are canceling, l's cancel. We have, if you look at this, you've got 2 to the minus 1 to the n, minus 2 to the minus 1 to the n, using one of the ones there. Zero! All right, so this is all gone, and you're just left with 1 is usually equal to 1, except for you already have jumps. Yay, it works. So the Fourier of one and one. So the the fall from grace of term by term differentiation is replaced with this modification. Hmm. At least for the Fourier sine series. Yeah. Makes sense. Now it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. It didn't yesterday. It's it starts <laughs> to make some sense, yeah. Now there's also a term by term integration theorem, right? And basically it says you can integrate term by term with relatively benign conditions. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna prove that in here because it would eat a bunch of our time and it's not that exciting. But I might ask you guys to prove it as a homework. Wait, prove what is again? 
For what again? Integration term by term. Oh. Because I think. So, um, yeah, let me just go ahead and assign that so that <clears throat> I might ask you guys to present that for me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So that is the proof on page 124 to 125. Well, it's really to 126. It's the proof that you can integrate the Fourier series, term by term. So it'd be good for you guys to try to work through that. I'll make that your next homework. It doesn't look uh, 124 to 126. It doesn't look too different than this, but I couldn't immediately understand it when I read it earlier today. So, and there has there's some details in that that are left as an exercise. Right. So most of the homework I'm just saying is to actually kind of fill out those details. Mm -hmm. All right. So <coughs> past this point, basically what he says is, okay, so we got this term by term differentiation. So he proposes basically a, a series that can be differentiated term by term and um, it has because it has um, you uh, well it has zero at L and zero at zero it's a Fourier sine series you can differentiate a term by you know this we can differentiate term by term and um, you can also partial differentiate it with respect to time and you can see that you basically take this series and solve the heat equation. So you basically, after all of this, he's like, check it out. We can we can differentiate we can partially differentiate the series, and it's going to solve the heat equation, provided that um, the heat equation we're looking at has u of zero zero and u of l zero, hmm. which you might assume for physical reasons. Otherwise, uh, anyway, um, so. It just kind of comes full circle back to what we started with. Okay, so <clears throat> one other comment here, and then I will hopefully do some. Do we have enough time? Yeah, we got. What on earth was that? Um, if you look at this, where did I put my? Oh, there's my eraser. One thing I should do while I've got all this up here is <clears throat> I don't have too much to say about. Man, it takes forever to prove anything in here. Where to work a problem? I mean, that's the <laughs> frustration, frustrating part about this material. Is like, it takes forever to write anything. If you look at this, right? If you um, you can rewrite that. Um, I mean, here's the thing: the exponential of I n pi x over L, right, is the cosine of n pi x over L plus I times the sine of n pi x over L, right? Mm -hmm. Euler's formula. So if you're willing um, to introduce some imaginary coefficients, you can repackage all of that together. You could write something like f of x is just equal to a sum over say, you know, n equals 1 to infinity, or I guess n equals 0, you could do 0, 0 to infinity, of say c, c sub n, e to the um, n pi x, um, well, i n pi x over l. And if you were to do such a thing, um, this would be, you know, c0 would just be on its lonesome. And um, then you'd have like c1 e to the, um, you know, i pi x over l, etc., you know. So if you look at this, right, this would be like c1 times the cosine of pi x over l plus i times the sine of pi x over l. So that suggests that 
this this should be equal to, I mean, if you start comparing this and that, you should have this is equal to like the A1 cosine um, pi x over L, right? Um, plus the uh, plus the B1 sine pi x over L. Sorry, I forgot to work myself into a corner again. And if you just like compare, you should see that you have C1. Um, so you multiply this through, right? You get C1 cosine Plus I C1 sine. Uh, but I'm going to say this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm still not saying it right. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, man, all of a sudden, that's not the right way to look at it. I'm an idiot. So. Look, if I just take um, yeah, just just look at what what's what's a sub n plus man makes sense when I looked at it yesterday. Oh, he actually, uh, oh, I see, I see, it's not as simple as I thought. So what he, what his approach, yeah, okay, fine, his approach is, it, it'd take me ten minutes to do what he does. I guess I could do it. Um, so if you, um, change the cosine and sine to imaginary exponentials and then regroup things, you can get to this. So, um, Cosine, cosine is like cosine of n pi x over l, one half e to the. Oh man, I'm gonna get sick of. Let's say that that's cosine gamma, yeah. So that's one half e to the i gamma plus e to the minus i gamma, and the sine of n pi x over l is one over two i e to the i gamma minus e to the minus i gamma. Or again, gamma is n pi x over l. So if you, you take those and you put those up in here, all right, Just uh, what's that give us? Like, you know, so you can you can collect the e to the i gamma terms, right? So you have it like a sub n over two plus. Um, well, let's get to the point here. A sub n plus i b sub n over two. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Do you, you know how i works? If I got 1 over i, it's equal to minus i, right? So I shouldn't say plus i b sub n here. I should say minus i b n. And these are the um, e to the i gamma terms. Does that make sense? So what I'm doing is I'm just collecting this guy and that guy. And then over here, you can collect the... Um, the other ones. So I've got like a sub n, this time minus comes plus i b n over 2, um, e to the minus i gamma. do. 
then he does something a little bit sneaky. He rewrites the first summation. Ooh, this is very sneaky. This is very sneaky. He writes this guy, right, as the sum, oh, sorry, plus, the sum, watch this, guys, n equals minus 1 to minus infinity. Um, let me say m equals minus 1 to minus infinity. So he's, what he's making, the substitution make, he's making here is m is equal to minus n, all right? So this gives us, of course, like a sub um, minus m minus i b sub minus m over 2 e to the minus i gamma. Well, fine. I guess I have to write it out. m pi x over l. Okay, so then he says, if you just, um, he says from the definitions of a sub n and b sub n, we have, no, we get, we've, we've actually really only thought of, of a sub n or b sub n as being defined for, for positive numbers, but if you look at the definitions we gave for them, they equally well apply for integers. So, I mean, look look at this. Like, this makes sense whether n is a count number or not. With that understanding, you can have erased them, but you can see that the a sub n is equal to eight is equal to a sub minus n, and you can see that the b sub n is equal to minus b sub minus n because the one's got a sine, the one's got a cosine, so the mm -hmm. cosine one, when you replace n by minus n, it doesn't affect it. But the sine, when you replace n by minus n, you pull out a minus, thus bringing in, so the, the coefficients are odd in the sense. So wait, why is, why is he making the switch now again? It's not clear yet. Oh. So, here's the even oddness. So basically, he makes this definition, c0 is equal to a0, a zero, and cn is equal to a sub n plus i b sub n over 2, all right? This was supposed to, be, okay, yeah. So you notice that becomes a sub m plus i b sub n in view of this. And so, in, in, in summary, you can just write <laughs> f of x is basically just the sum um, n equals minus infinity to infinity of c sub n e to the minus n pi, i n pi rather minus i n pi x over l where where c n is defined to be 1 over 2 l integral from minus l to l um, f of x e to the i n pi x over l dx for all in.